I am Ryan McKnight. I'm Kara Santa Maria. I am Christopher Smith. Hi, I'm Andrew Torres. This, this is Naked Mormonism. Mormonism, the Serial Mormon History Podcast. All right, everybody. The Nauvoo Expositor had been destroyed. Lawsuits had been filed. The constable from Carthage had tried to arrest Joseph Smith, and he refused to be carried to Carthage for that hearing, and instead held his own sham trials in an attempt to kind of assuage all of the allegations against him and his co-conspirators. The state of Illinois was in turmoil as state militia leaders amassed their forces for a siege of Nauvoo. Nauvoo itself was under martial law, and the Legion was building breastworks and digging trenches around vulnerable areas of the city in preparation for war. The anti-Mormons in Carthage and Warsaw had passed resolutions calling on the citizens of Illinois, Missouri, and Iowa Territory to commit a war of extermination against the Mormons if Joe couldn't be apprehended and brought to Carthage. Governor Thomas Ford was camped out in Carthage where he'd set up his field headquarters from which to command the state militia in the case of bloodshed. More than anything, Governor Ford wanted to resolve this issue amicably between the Mormons and the anti-Mormons, but the Mormon leadership and the anti-Mormon meetings and newspapers had escalated tensions for years, and that peaceful resolution seemed like a fleeting possibility. The only thing to keep all out war from breaking out was to get Joseph and Hiram Smith in the custody of the state. Just them, not with 50 of their Danite buddies. The letter that we read from Governor Ford last week to Joseph Smith contains a crucial line in the concluding paragraphs. Quote, in case the persons accused, Joseph and Hiram, should make no resistance to an arrest, it will be against order to be accompanied by others, the Danites. If it should become necessary to have witnesses on the trial, I will see that such persons as may thus be brought to this place from Nauvoo, either for trial or as witnesses for the accused. If the individuals accused cannot be found when required by the constable, it will be considered by me as an equivalent to a refusal to be arrested and the militia will be ordered accordingly, end quote. That's a straightforward order issued by the governor of Illinois enforcing the legal orders of a legally appointed circuit court judge. There was no higher body available at this time to enforce the law on Joseph Smith. Now, this may surprise some of you to hear, but the federal government was less powerful than state governments, right? Governors acted as presidents of their states, and states held more power than the federal government of the United States. States are sovereign entities which had to give the federal government permission to exist by ratifying the constitutions. The states predate the federal government. If you lived in the state of Illinois, Governor Ford had more power over your conduct than President John Tyler. It wasn't until the 14th Amendment was ratified in 1868, eight, resulting from the Civil War, that states were incorporated under the power of the federal government. Prior to 1868, states and their legislative bodies held more power than the federal government did. There also wasn't an FBI or any interstate police force for that matter. Only state militias, which could grant temporary authority to the president to operate as a federal militia, but only if circumstances required and only if the governors of those states agreed that the president would be the immediate commander in chief. Government had largely the same structure in the early to mid 19th century as it does today, but the practices and kind of the power dynamics at the time were very, very different. And that's a roundabout way of saying that Joseph Smith had so aggressively flaunted the law that the governor of his state had to step in and handle matters personally. That's not getting called to the principal's office for fighting on the playground. That's getting called I, – I, I, well, I can't use you know our current president as a good example. Maybe like a, some tribunal at the Bohemian Grove or something like that to answer for something what that you did wrong. I mean you kind of see my point by this, right? Like Governor Thomas Ford carried the weight of the entire government of Illinois with him and his voice was absolute in this conflict. He had total control over the state militias including the Nauvoo Legion. And all law enforcement in the state was done so under the seal of the state executive, Governor Ford. So Ford ordering Joe to comply with the original arrest warrant was literally the highest legal authority telling a regular citizen to follow the law. 
There was no going over Governor Ford's head. There was no ignoring the order. Defying the order carried with it the consequences of war, as stated in Governor Ford's letter. Now, Joe's reply to Governor Ford wasn't reassuring, right? Joe wanted to appeal the matter to the Supreme Court and speak with President Tyler directly in an, an attempt to go over Governor Ford's head, while at the same time telling Ford, quote, if anything wrong has been done on our part, and we have no of nothing, oh, we've done nothing wrong, we will make all things right if the government will give us the opportunity, end quote. The problem is that Joe wasn't happy with the consequences of his own actions, which Ford understood in totality, and Joe just wanted to keep going up the government ladder until he could get somebody to nullify those consequences of his own actions by siding with him. However, a person can't just appeal a case immediately to the Supreme Court, especially a criminal case that was handled at a municipal level. You can't just go straight from a municipal court to the Supreme Court. That's not how it works. It would need to be judged against Joe and Hiram in the Circuit Court of Carthage and then appealed to the state Supreme Court of Illinois, then to the district court, and then finally petitions could be filed for cert to the Supreme Court. That process of appeals would take this case years to resolve, but the law was so incredibly against Joe's actions that the consequences and negative press of, of this drawn-out process would grind the Mormon movement to a halt, especially as this was a criminal matter. And Joe wouldn't be allowed to just walk free during this this appeal process all the way up to the Supreme Court. He would be moved around in state custodies until it was ultimately resolved. So with the general kind of anti-rebellion bend of the federal government at the time and Joe exhibiting all the tendencies of a rebellion in the state of Illinois, no system of government would allow him to continue ruling Nauvoo the way that he was. Every day in Nauvoo since its inception was on borrowed time, mortgaged against the general rule of law in the federal government, and the clock was running out, and everybody could feel the clock running out. The Mormon leadership's blatant abuse of power, however, didn't stop them from packaging and maybe even personally believing this to be religious persecution. When John Taylor returned from Carthage as one of the discreet messengers that Governor Ford called for— John Taylor related, related his meeting with the governor to Joe and all that were present in the city council that day. And here's how John Taylor, second prophet of the Utah church, tells his side of the story of the meeting with Governor Ford. Quote, After waiting the governor's pleasure for some time, we had an audience, but such an audience. He was surrounded by some of the vilest and most unprincipled men in creation. Some of them had an appearance of respectability, but many of them lacked even that. Wilson and I believe William Law were there, Foster, Frank and Chauncey Higby, Mr. Marr, a lawyer from Nauvoo, a mobocratic merchant from Warsaw, Joseph H. Jackson, a number of his associates, and the governor's secretary, in all some 15 or 20 persons, most of whom were recreant to virtue, honor, integrity, and everything that is considered honorable among men. I can well remember the feelings of disgust that I had in seeing the governor surrounded by such an infamous group and on being introduced to men of so questionable a character. And had I been on private business, I should have turned to depart and told the governor that if he thought proper to associate with such questionable characters, I should beg leave to be excused. But coming as we did on public business, we could not, of course, consult on our private feelings. End quote. So already uh, with John Taylor's recounting of this meeting, the, the dehumanization of the enemies of this kingdom of God was complete. Every person, regardless of their standing or their occupation, of their perspective on the, the growing conflict, regardless of their elected office, nothing mattered. All of them were the most vile and unprincipled men in creation. That's what John Taylor said about all of them, which all but guaranteed each and every one of those men viewed John Taylor the exact same way and likely voiced their opinions quite loudly in the presence of Governor Ford during this meeting. Even Joseph H. Jackson and five of the seven printers of the Nauvoo Expositor were there. Now, this was probably for the best because none of them were called to testify in the Nauvoo municipal hearings concerning the criminal conduct that was committed against them by the mayor and his cronies. Likely, John Taylor hadn't interacted with any of these men since the expositor was destroyed and they were chased out of town and had to flee to Carthage. And, you know, all, all of these men 
in the same place at the same time talking about the same issues. It is certainly made for some heated conversation in this group of guys. The only cool head in the room was the guy who was in control, Thomas Ford. But even cool heads can heat up with enough friction. So after setting the scene, John Taylor began to tell Ford his side of the story. Quote, We then stated to the governor that in accordance with his request, General Joseph Smith had, in response to his call, sent us to him as a member of the conference, that we were acquainted with most of the circumstances that had transpired in and about Nauvoo lately and were prepared to give him the information, that, moreover, we had in our possession testimony and affidavits confirmatory of what we should say, which had been forwarded to him by General Joseph Smith. The communications have been forwarded to his excellency by Mrs. Hunter, James and others, some of which had not reached their destination, but of which we had duplicates with us. That's, of course, because Mr. Hunter and James were headed to Springfield right now to have a meeting with Governor Ford, not realizing that Governor Ford had already headed to Carthage to figure out what was going on in person. But luckily, John Taylor brought duplicates of everything that they were, you know, those messengers had with them in order to show his excellency exactly what was going on from the Mormon perspective. He continues, we then in brief related an outline of the difficulties and the course we had pursued from the commencement of the troubles up to the present and handing him the documents respectfully submitted the whole. End quote. All right. So this is troubling to me because John Taylor didn't provide any view into exactly what he said to Governor Ford. Obviously, his side of the story was consistent with all of the collected affidavits. But beyond that, what did he tell Governor Ford about those municipal hearings that discharged Joe and his 17 co-conspirators? What did he tell Governor Ford about the charges of the expositor destruction causing a riot? How did he respond to Ford when asked about martial law and arresting people in the city? What did Taylor tell Governor Ford about the allegations of stolen property from the expositor office? What did he say to Ford while in the presence of those men who suffered the criminal acts of the Nauvoo elite? There were five of the seven publishers of the expositor were in that room with him. It's a disappointing account, and I can't find any other document which sheds further light on this meeting. I can, however turned to Governor Ford's report to the state legislature in December, which he recounted the events from his point of view concerning this meeting. This is from the History of Illinois, beginning on page 325, quote, It appeared clearly, both from the complaints of the citizens and the acknowledgments of the Mormon committee, that the whole proceedings of the mayor, the common council, and the municipal court were irregular and illegal, and not to be endured in a free country. Though perhaps some apology might be made for the court, as it had been repeatedly assured by some of the best lawyers in the state who had been candidates for office before that people, that it had a full and competent power to issue writs of habeas corpus in all cases whatever. The common council violated the law in assuming the exercise of judicial power in proceeding ex parte without notice to the owners of the property in proceeding against the property in rem in not calling a jury in not swearing all the witnesses in not giving the owners of the property accused of being a nuisance in consequence of being libelous an opportunity of giving the truth in evidence and in fact by not proceeding by civil suit or indictment as in other cases of libel The mayor violated the law, the mayor being Joseph Smith, of course, violated the law in ordering this erroneous and absurd judgment of the common council to be executed. And the municipal court erred in discharging them from arrest, end quote. So in some ways, the meeting with John Tyler, John Taylor, not Tyler, not not the president, but John Taylor, the second president of the Utah church. The meeting with John Taylor confirmed to Governor Ford what he suspected was the cause of all of the fury between the Mormons and the anti-Mormons. The citizens made complaints of what had happened, and Taylor was part of the quote-unquote Mormon committee, which acknowledged the proceedings of the mayor, Joseph Smith. And what's interesting here is like truth has a way of finding its way through all of the noise when it's sought by a tempered and intelligent mind like Governor Ford's. And he added a poignant remark about the fury rising from the destruction of the expositor, not the allegations printed by it. Quote, as this proceeding touched the liberty of the press, which is justly dear to any Republican people, it was well calculated to raise a great flame of excitement. And it may be well questioned whether years of misrepresentation by the most profligate newspaper could have engendered such a feeling as was produced by the destruction of this one press. 
It is apparent that the Mormon leaders but little understood and regarded less the true principles of civil liberty. A free press well conducted is a great blessing to a free people. A profligate one is likely soon to deprive itself of all credit and influence by the multitude of falsehoods put forth by it. Uh, Apparently, Governor Ford couldn't have foreseen the existence of Fox News. But let this be as it may, there is more lost to rational liberty by a censorship of the press, by suppressing information proper to be known to the people, than can be lost to an individual now and then by a temporary injury to his character and influence by the utmost licentiousness, end quote. Basically, it's better to have a freedom of press and let truth come from the aggregate than to have censorship of single newspapers when one guy is offended by what they're printing. And I really love Governor Ford's take on the law and the ideology of freedom of the press here, as it stands as the best argument when claiming that Joe and Hiram absolutely deserve to be in Carthage jail for their crimes of a tyrannical nature. Regardless of what John Taylor told Governor Ford during this meeting, surrounded by enemies of the church and Joseph Smith, Ford did have a clear view of the legality of the situation and who was responsible for the illegal acts. Continuing with uh, John Taylor's account of this meeting, quote, During our conversation and explanations with the governor, we were frequently rudely and impudently contradicted by the fellows he had around him and of whom he seemed to take no notice. I mean, yeah, the, the, he was surrounded by at least five of the seven publishers of the Nova Expositor, Joseph H. Jackson and his little posse of friends, and a number of people who were enemies to the church or at least enemies to Joseph Smith. Taylor continues, he opened and read a number of the documents himself, the affidavits that John Taylor brought with him, and as he proceeded, he was frequently interrupted by, that's a lie! That's a goddamned lie! That's an infernal falsehood! That's a blasted lie! Etc. End quote. So my question is, like, what exactly were these men objecting to? And we'll never know. And we've read a ton of those affidavits the past few weeks on the show. And I've repeatedly pointed out that there's absolutely no corroboration for what specific affidavits said beyond just the person saying it in the presence of Whiteout Willard Richards, who was clerk for Nauvoo and Joe's chief propaganda minister. And it's clear to me that the people attending this meeting bristled similarly against the various accusations, but without any specifics provided by John Taylor, I can't begin to tease apart whether Taylor was right or whether the anti-Mormons in the meeting calling him a liar were right. There just isn't enough data in the historical record to figure out, but we can be certain that the most dangerous falsehoods are those which are buried within the truth which is probably the best way to describe the Mormon affidavits that Governor Ford was reading in this meeting. The majority of the content was probably true, it could have been true, but little falsehoods peppered in to these various accounts would infuriate anybody trying to convince Governor Ford that the Mormon leadership was lying. And Governor Ford was too smart to immediately believe either side of the conflict. He was doing his job the right way, when the right way wasn't always a clear path. He even states in his History of Illinois concerning this time that, quote, During this time also, I had secret agents among all the parties observing their movements and was accurately informed of everything which was meditated on both sides, end quote. Because Ford couldn't trust either the Mormons or the anti-Mormons, he put spies all around the two cities to feed untainted information to him to cut through all of the chaos that was rising around him. John Taylor continues this meeting, quote, These men evidently winced on an exposure of their acts and thus vulgarly, impudently and falsely repudiated them. One of their number, Mr. Marr, addressed himself several times to me while in conversation with the governor. I did not notice him until after a frequent repetition of his insolence when I informed him that my business at the time was with Governor Ford, whereupon I continued my conversation with his excellency, end quote. Good job, John Taylor. You do you, buddy. This guy just kept accosting him while he was trying to tell Governor Ford about what was going on. And he just told him to shut up and let's do the business that he was here to do in the first place. Now, that detail is a testament to how inflamed the people were and how high tensions really were at this time. And it, it honestly, it was a miracle to have all of these men in the same room without a brawl breaking out. And if not for Governor Ford being there, 
a brawl would have happened, and that would have sparked the Illinois Mormon War the same way that the Gallatin Election Day fight set off the powder keg of the Missouri Mormon War back in August of 1838. John Taylor continues, quote, During the conversation, the governor expressed a desire that Joseph Smith and all parties concerned in passing or executing the city law in relation to the press, it's declaring it a nuisance, had better come to Carthage, that however repugnant it might be to our feelings, he thought it would have a tendency to allay public excitement and prove to the people what we professed, that we wished to be governed by law. Right. Joseph Smith, if he just comes in, if he comes in and stands trial, that's going to allay a lot of the public excitement because – If you say that you wish to be governed by the law, make your actions comport with your words. We represented to him the course we had taken in relation to this matter, our willingness to go before another magistrate other than the municipal court of Carthage. The illegal refusal of our request by the constable, our dismissal by the municipal court of Nauvoo, a legally constituted tribunal, our subsequent trial before Esquire Wells in Nauvoo. At the instance of Judge Thomas and our dismissal by him, that we had fulfilled the law in every particular, that it was our enemies who were breaking the law and having murderous designs were only making use of this as a pretext to get us into their power, end quote. So Taylor's argument to Governor Ford here is predicated on the idea that the Mormons were on the right side of the law. But as soon as we can judge that the Nauvoo City Council acted against the rule of law, everything that Taylor just said to Governor Ford is completely moot. And we have dealt with each and every one of these arguments in the past few episodes since the expositor was destroyed. And Taylor had no legal ground to stand on making this argument to Governor Ford, although he was just parroting the Mormon version of events, the Mormon propaganda here. But Governor Ford was no idiot, and he responded accordingly, quote, The governor stated that the people viewed it differently, and that notwithstanding our opinions, he would recommend that the people should be satisfied, end quote. What is that satisfaction? Get Joseph and Hiram Smith before the circuit court at Carthage under charges of riot and other illegal acts, and then let everybody testify to the facts in court where this issue really belonged. However, John Taylor's point that everything was merely a murderous design and the anti-Mormons were using these legal issues, quote, as a pretext to get us in their power, end quote, that does hold some truth, unfortunately. The Nauvoo government committed crimes at the direction of Joseph Smith, but rest assured, the Mormons have made enough enemies in the surrounding cities that surrendering to arrest and extradition to Carthage would open up Joe and Hiram to vigilante justice, right? Arresting people for the purpose of making them vulnerable to a vigilante mob to lynch them, that is reprehensible. But does that grant the people license to ignore arrest orders? That really is a fundamental question at issue here. If Joe's life would be threatened by adhering to the law, should he still adhere to the law? When taken in isolation, it's, you know, it isn't such an easy question to answer, but when we view that question in the larger context of Joe's growing tyrannical and revolutionary tendencies and everything that he had done in Nauvoo, this instance of him refusing the arrest warrant was merely a final straw breaking that camel's back, culminating half a decade of lawlessness. Taylor continues, quote, We then remarked to the governor that should Joseph Smith comply with his request, it would be extremely unsafe in the present excited state of the country to come without an armed force, that we had a sufficiency of men and were competent to defend ourselves, but that there might be danger of collision should our forces and that of our enemies be brought in such close proximity, end quote. Now, that's actually a super interesting point made by John Taylor. If Joe surrenders and comes into Carthage without an armed guard, he's as good as dead. If he allows an armed guard, we're competent enough to fight off the vigilantes. But if he comes in with an armed guard, there's no way to stop the forces from coming into collision, being in such close proximity to each other. So what would you do in Governor Ford's situation? Would you let Joe come in armed and give him a chance to defend himself? Or would you bet on your own ability to control the public and the arresting posse to not take vigilante justice as soon as he steps foot inside the city of Carthage? If you allow 
an armed posse of Mormons to walk into Carthage when all the anti-Mormons are armed as well, how would you possibly keep violence from breaking out, resulting in a few hundred corpses and the beginning of an all-out war? I mean, it, it, it really is a tough situation, but Ford made the decision best calculated to keep tensions where they were instead of boiling out of control. Quote, he strenuously advised us not to bring any arms and pledged his faith as governor and the faith of the state that we should be protected and that he would guarantee our perfect safety, end quote. Now, there is a small sentence that was removed from the official history of the church, but was restored through Dan Vogel's tireless research from the original sources of the John Taylor manuscript autobiography in the source and text critical edition of the history of the church. Here it is. This is the part that was removed from the official published version of the history of the church. Quote, we had at that time about 5,000 under arms, 1,000 of which would have been amply sufficient for our protection. End quote. And that sentence was removed from the official history of the church. But because Dan Vogel restored the history of the church from the original documents, it has been retained in his source and text critical edition. That's really interesting because the anti-Mormons were less than a thousand in number by this time. And Governor Ford puts that militia number around 1,300 men a few days from this point as people were arriving into Carthage from all over the state as well as from Iowa and from Missouri. But the posse that Taylor wanted to bring Joe and Hiram to Carthage wasn't some you know 50 guys or 100 guys, but an armed force large enough to completely overwhelm the anti-Mormon forces if a fight broke out. He wanted to bring a thousand armed men to escort Joseph Smith into Carthage. How would the Carthaginians react to Joe and Hiram leading their own army larger than the standing army of the state of Illinois into this city just to adhere to an arrest warrant? How could violence possibly be avoided here? Taylor wraps his account of the meeting, quote, at the termination of our interview and previous to our withdrawal, after a long conversation and the perusal of the documents which we had brought, the governor informed us that he would prepare a written communication for General Joseph Smith, which he desired us to wait for. We were kept waiting for this instrument some five or six hours. <laughs> Governor Ford was a thoughtful guy. <laughs> we read through his letter last week. It didn't take us five or six hours to get through the whole thing. He just took his time so he could make sure that he was writing the correct thing. And I admire that. Taylor finishes. About five o'clock in the afternoon, we took our departure with not the most pleasant feelings. The associations of the governor, the spirit that he manifested to compromise with those scoundrels, the length of time he had kept us waiting, and his general deportment together with the infernal spirit that we saw exhibited by those whom he admitted to his counsel made the prospect anything but promising, end quote. Governor Ford's lack of willingness to compromise, that shouldn't strike us as surprising, when the Mormon leadership was clearly in the wrong here, right? Like this is an issue like Book of Mormon archaeology. The church leadership will always be wrong until they change their behavior. There is no compromise when one side is simply wrong. The middle ground between right and wrong on issues, whether the historicity of the Book of Mormon or the tyranny of burning down a printing press, there is no middle ground. That middle ground is non-existent. You don't compromise with people about whether or not water is wet, Right? People are largely made out of water and carbon. No, they aren't. Humans are fairy dust made in a cauldron in the sky by a white guy with a beard. Look, one side can be totally wrong about something. And Governor Ford's unwillingness to compromise on Joseph Smith going to court in Carthage exhibits to us that Ford knew who was wrong in this conflict. The Mormon leadership. John Taylor told Joe this whole story about the meeting. He wrote it down which Joe received late that night, and he stayed up until midnight writing his reply to Governor Ford. And we read through that entire letter, and we discussed both of those letters near the end of last week's episode. Willard Richards recorded in his journal how the leadership dealt with this issue. And it's in the history of the church, so it's written from Joseph Smith's first-person perspective, but it was initially recorded by Willard Richards, a whiteout Willard Richards, in his journal. Quote, 
I, Joseph Smith, had consultation for a little while with my brother Hiram, Dr. Richards, John Taylor, and John M. Bernheisel, and determined to go to Washington and lay the matter before President Tyler, end quote. So Joe had met with a president before to address grievances, and he was told by the president at the time, Martin Van Buren, that he could do nothing for the Mormons. Did Joe really believe that this time would be different when the circumstances were fundamentally different? During that meeting with Martin Van Buren in 1839, the Mormons had just been chased out of Missouri. They were living in tents and wagons on the banks of the Mississippi. They were destitute refugees seeking welfare from the government to merely survive. Yet Van Buren's hands were tied. In this case, though, the Mormon leadership had acted out of tyranny to silence critical voices of their movement. They had flaunted the law and declared Nauvoo a sovereign city-state, an overt act of treason. Did they really believe that John Tyler would act differently than Martin Van Buren, given these different circumstances? Or, and, and this is how I personally view it, was this just a ploy to generate more of the persecution complex? Right, Being turned away by one president, that generated hours of persecution narrative in the following four years from Nauvoo pulpits that solidified the concept of persecution in the minds of every Mormon. Being turned away by another president would be yet more ammunition for the Mormon leadership that they were persecuted and their government refused to do anything for them. Therefore, the government has been corrupted by the adversary and only we can save it while the Constitution hangs by a thread. This was a calculated measure, the impact of which would never be realized because the meeting with John Tyler, President John Tyler, never ended up happening. But Joe and his closest confidants knew that it was getting too hot in Nauvoo. And a meeting with the president, that was an actionable item. However, Governor Ford was headed to Nauvoo to arrest Joe the next day with a posse of 30 men. <laughs> This was not a large enough force for the Nauvoo Legion to consider a declaration of war. These 30 men were headed there just to arrest Joseph and Hiram and nothing else. If they were impeded in any way, Governor Ford would consider that an act of aggression and war would break out. If Joe and Hiram weren't in Nauvoo on the morning of the 23rd of June, Ford told Joe explicitly in his letter that it would, quote, be considered by me as an equivalent to a refusal to be arrested and the militia will be ordered accordingly, end quote. Joe and Hiram were going to Carthage the morning of the 23rd of June or Nauvoo would be at war with Illinois. Now, I cannot stress enough how much these Mormon versus anti-Mormon settlements were on a knife edge of war. Any move could be construed as aggression, and that would justify the militia to siege and attack the city of Nauvoo. Joe and Hiram were pinned. So Joe called a huddle with his brother and a few of his friends to workshop this and to figure out exactly how they were going to survive the next 12 hours without being arrested. Quote, at sundown, I asked O.P. Rockwell, Pistol Pack and Porter, if he would go with me a short journey, and he replied he would. Abraham C. Hoge says that soon after dark, Joseph called Hiram, Willard Richards, John Taylor, W.W. Phelps, double dub. A.C. Hoge, John L. Butler, Alpheus Cutler, William Marks, and some others into his upper room and said, Brethren, here is a letter from the governor which I wish to have read. After it was read through, Joseph remarked, and I see this as like defeatedly remarked, There is no mercy, no mercy here. Hiram said, No, just as sure as we fall into their hands, we are dead men. Joseph replied, Yes, what shall we do, Brother Hiram? Hiram replied, I do not know. End quote. This letter from Governor Ford said it had an ultimatum agree to be arrested or you're at war with us. Joe and Hiram were not just pinned, they were defeated. 
Only two weeks after the expositor was destroyed and the brothers had committed an act of overt tyranny, they had incited a riot, they declared martial law for their own protection, they set up night watches and men to guard every location of value or interest in the city, including the Nauvoo neighbor, the printing press, and Joe's Nauvoo mansion. They had a letter from Governor Ford telling them to surrender or Nauvoo was at war. And just like the letter that Joe received from General Lucas on the night of October 31st, 1838, telling him and the Mormon leadership to surrender or far west would be laid to ashes. This letter from Governor Ford contained the ultimatum that would result in the deaths of hundreds or thousands of Mormons if the demands weren't met. Now, this is one of those times in history where I simply wish that I could be a fly on the wall or a cockroach under the floorboards for just a few hours to see this meeting with Joseph Hiram and his conspirators that burned the printing press. I wish I could see what was going on here. What And what was actually said, we'll never know because this is junk that George A. Smith made up in 1856 from conversation with Double Dub Phelps and John Taylor who were actually there. But still, this meeting did happen that night and I wish I could witness it and learn what was really said. Regardless, this was the outcome of the meeting and the way that it was recorded in the history of the church by George A. Smith. Quote, All at once, Joseph's countenance brightened up, and he said, The way is open. It is clear to my mind what to do. All they want is Hiram and myself. Then tell everybody to go about their business and not to collect in groups, but scatter about. There is no doubt they will come here and search for us. Let them search. They will not harm you in person or property and not even a hair of your head. We will cross the river tonight and go away to the West. End quote. Oh, real original, Joe. Run away. Yeah, real, real original. Just like Kirtland, when your bank failed and the leadership wanted to hold an inquisition about your sexual exploits with Fanny Alger. Just like Missouri, when you waged war against the state and you were locked up in prison for murder and treason. Just like in Colesville, New York, when you were held on trial for disorderly conduct, when the townsfolk nearly lynched you after the court discharged you for lack of jurisdiction. Just like in Harmony, Pennsylvania, when your father-in-law wouldn't just accept your lies and wanted to help you get started in an honest business if you just give up the gold Bible speculation. Just run away. There was, however, a major flaw in running away this time. Joe, <laughs> Governor Ford told Joe explicitly if the arresting posse couldn't find Hiram and Joe when they arrived in Nauvoo on the morning of the 23rd, the militia would be called out. If the militia descended on Nauvoo, Without the Legion's commander-in-chief, Joseph Smith, there to react, what was the Nauvoo Legion supposed to do? The city was under orders of martial law, and they've been building defenses and digging trenches for a couple of days now. Was the city just expected to surrender in Joe's absence? And Joe claiming that the militia wouldn't harm the Mormons in any in person or property or harm a hair on their head. Clearly, he didn't understand that that was literally the point of calling out a state militia in the first place to put down domestic rebellions. If Joe wasn't there to keep his legion from reacting with force to the state militia walking into Nauvoo, war would break out and Nauvoo would be ransacked and destroyed just like far west and Adam on Diamond after the Mormons surrendered in the Missouri Mormon War. This plan to run away to the West instead of just agreeing to be arrested, it was purely self-serving. This is solely for the preservation of Joseph and Hiram. But the decision was made. Let the consequences follow. Quote, Joseph made a move to go out of the house to cross the river. When out of the doors, he told Butler and Hoach to take the maid of Iowa, the steamer they had, get it to the upper landing and put his and Hiram's families and effects upon her. Then go down the Mississippi and up the Ohio River to Portsmouth, where they should hear from them. He then took Hoge by the hand and said, now, brother Hoge, let what will come. Don't deny the faith and all will be well. End quote. So not only were Joe and Hiram running when they were supposed to be arrested the very next morning, they were running tonight. And Joe told some of his pawns to go collect their families and their effects and transport it all up the Ohio River where they would rendezvous at some undetermined point in the future. 
F*** Nauvoo. F*** my 20,000 followers. F*** the law because my life is in real danger. Oh, yeah, and Brother Hoach, you're still useful to me, so uh, what I just told you to do, you know, don't deny the faith. Just do everything that I say and all will be well. Seriously, what the hell does this say about Joseph Smith as a person if this was his reaction to a boiling conflict, a conflict that he created in the first place, the chips are down. His people are in real danger of warfare, extermination, and lots and lots of death. And he chooses to run? This is a pattern exhibited at every point in Joe's life. When the pressure gets too high, he runs away instead of confronting the consequences of his own actions. Do what is right. Let the consequence follow. I remember singing that in primary and then walking to sacrament meeting to sing praise to the man who died as a martyr. This is not honorable behavior. This is pure and brazen cowardice when the chickens come home to roost. Nauvoo was on the precipice of war, and Governor Ford told Joe explicitly that if he didn't agree to be arrested and ran away, then it meant war. And Joe ran. This guaranteed the Illinois militia would invade Nauvoo within 48 hours. Once the 30-man arresting posse left Nauvoo with empty handcuffs and carried that intel that the prophet had absconded back to Governor Ford in Carthage. But a few affairs needed to be set in order before Joe and Hiram could cross the Mississippi that night. Quote, About 9 p.m., Hiram came out of the mansion and gave his hand to Reynolds Cahoon, at the same time saying, A company of men are seeking to kill my brother Joseph, and the Lord has warned him to flee to the Rocky Mountains to save his life. Goodbye, brother Cahoon. We shall see you again. In a few minutes afterwards, Joseph came from his family. His tears were flowing fast. He held a handkerchief to his face and followed after Brother Hiram without uttering a word. Joseph told Stephen Markham that if I and Hiram were ever taken again, we should be massacred or I was not a prophet of God. I want Hiram to live to avenge my blood, but he is determined not to leave me, end quote. So that last bit. You know, if we're ever taken again, we should be massacred or I'm not a prophet of God. That was added by George A. Smith in 1856. It's weird how you can make a dead person a true prophet 12 years after a prophecy had actually come true, right? Especially when you control everything that history knows about what that person said. Regardless, the plan was in place. Get Joe and Hiram across the Mississippi. Send Hoge to gather the Smith families and enough provisions to make the journey west. Rendezvous somewhere up the Ohio River. Then set out for the Rocky Mountains where the new Mormon settlement under Joseph Smith could be reconstructed without any interference from any governors, any constables, any militias, any justices, or any law whatsoever, for that matter. Joe and Hiram were departing that night for the Great Basin. They'd make camp somewhere along the banks of the Mississippi for the night. Then Hodge would find them the next morning with their horses in Montrose, Iowa. Then the brothers, with their families, would depart across land to cover Nebraska, Wyoming, to cross the Rockies, and then arrive in Mexico in a few months' time. Then, Bloody Brigham Young, Uncle John Smith, Double Dub Phelps, and a few others would organize the Mormon wagon trains in the following months to then make winter camp in Nebraska in order to prepare those Mormons for the two-month journey to Mexico during the following spring. Now, all the plans devised by Joe and his Council of 50 were now either altered or they were cast away, right? Like, no longer would Joe continue to run for president of the United States, at least not for a few more election cycles anyway. Nauvoo would be abandoned. The unfinished Nauvoo temple would be sold for whatever they could get to pay the expenses of the Mormon resettlement in Mexico. And once they were in Mexico, Joe would organize a meeting with the next president, whether it be John Calhoun or James Polk or whoever, again – seeking redress for the Mormon re grievances resulting from their extermination from Illinois. And uh, of course he would make that trip to go meet with the next president without passing through Illinois, Iowa or Missouri because arrest warrants would immediately be executed the second that he stepped foot in any of those States. The Mormon revolution machine could complete construction in Mexico outfitted to revolutionize this depraved secular nation into a totalitarian Mormon theocracy. It didn't matter how many Mormons survived. Converts are cheap and plentiful. As long as Joe and Hiram survived these immediate threats to their lives in late June, 1844, the Mormon theocracy still stood a chance running away was an act of spinelessness it was an act of sacrifice of the well-being of thousands of Mormons for Zion.
Zion would be constructed come hell or high water, and the corpses of thousands of oppressed Mormons would serve as its foundation. We just need to keep Joe and Hiram alive for the plan to work. But Joe also needed plants all over America who could toe the party line and spread Mormon propaganda and who could return to Nauvoo to coordinate the exodus once the fire in Illinois had died down a little bit. Quote, between 9 and 10 p.m., this is the 22nd of June, Joseph Hiram and Willard Richards, while waiting on the banks of the river for the skiff, sent for W.W. Phelps double dub, and instructed him to take their families to Cincinnati by the second steamboat arriving at Nauvoo. And when he arrived there to commence petitioning the president of the United States and Congress for a redress of grievances and see if they would grant the church liberty and equal rights. Equal rights would land Joseph Smith and Hiram in jail. They were literally running away from equal rights. Joseph then said, to Phelps, go to our wives and tell them what we have concluded to do and learn their feelings on the subject and tell Emma you will be ready to start by the second steamboat and she has sufficient money wherewith to pay the expenses. <laughs> if you ascertain by tomorrow morning that there is anything wrong, come over the river to Montrose to the, to the house of Captain John Killian and there you will learn where we are, end quote. Okay, so all those plans that I talked about a minute ago, those were too far in the distance to be orchestrated immediately. But for the time being, survival by any means necessary was the plan. It was also quite notable that Joe sent Phelps to tell Emma that he's running away and to learn her feelings on the subject. And then... it's a, Okay, so the wharf where they're having this conversation, where they're waiting to board the skiff... It's like three blocks away from the mansion. Joe could have just walked the three minutes over there and told Emma himself, but he probably thought Emma might convince him not to run away and her cool head in this situation would get him killed. Also, it reads as if Joe wanted Emma and the kids to go with the, the Phelps family to D.C. in order to meet with President John Tyler and petition Congress for redress while Joe and Hiram were hightailing it to the Rockies <laughs> and that Emma would had enough money to pay the expenses for the trip. <laughs> yeah. What were her feelings? What could her feelings possibly be on this? Well, Emma like, okay. So Emma had a habit of cleaning up her husband's messes, right? What was just, you know, another meeting with the president of the United States on his behalf. Plus, yeah, she's fine. She's got enough money to buy passage for everybody. Wow, Joe, such a great husband. Just a real great guy. <sighs> Joe so clearly had his own interests in mind here. Like his own. Like this isn't a Monty Python movie where he's like bravely fleeing with Hiram behind him, like clacking coconut halves together. This is just a total lack of taking responsibility for actions. This is Joe running away from the music instead of facing it. There's no honor among cult leaders. There's no sacrifice made for the greater good here. This is pure narcissism and pure self-preservation. And if it isn't clear by this point, I can't seem to stress this point enough. Joe never willingly complied with the law here. He wasn't martyred. He was hopelessly craven and boldly arrogant to think that running would somehow solve his problems in this instance. Well, how did Emma react to Phelps telling her about the plan for them all to go to D.C. and that Joe was headed to the Rockies with Hiram and telling her this stuff at midnight and she was learning this information from one of her husband's friend instead of her own husband as he was prepping to cross the Mississippi to go into hiding. Not great. <laughs> And Emma was just so clearly tired of all of the nonsense through which her husband constantly dragged her and the kids. Quote, Double Dub Phelps says that Emma refused to go, but that Hiram's wife and the doctor's wife agreed to follow counsel. End quote. Counsel to go out to D.C. and meet with President John Tyler. <laughs> of course Emma refused to go. Of course she did. <laughs> but Joe actually wouldn't receive that until... Until the next day, because he was continuing to prepare for his river cross when he sent Phelps to go meet with his wife. Notably, though, Joe also understood that his plans to run away may not play out. 
So if he did land in jail and he survived the criminal trial for riot, he knew that a lot of his conduct was going to be called into question and documents would be sought by the prosecuting attorneys, right? In one of the most symbolic gestures of Joe's entire life, he gave instruction to William Clayton, Quilliam Claypen, as we call him. And these instructions would live in infamy from that time forward. Quote, one o'clock at night, John P. Green, that's an Abu City Marshal, called me, William Clayton, up, saying I was wanted at Joseph's. I immediately went down and found President Joseph and Dr. Richards preparing to leave the place. The governor has sent 30 men to take them to Carthage, and if they offer any resistance, he intends to call out the militia of the state and take them by force or arms. Joseph whispered and told me either to put the R of K into the hands of some faithful men and send them away or burn them or bury them. I concluded to bury them, which I did immediately on my return home. End quote. This is a relatively benign order outside of the context and without knowing what R of K mean. But when we consider to what Joe was referring here and Clay Penn's role as a scribe and what was expected to happen, this passage shifts into incredible focus. This is when Joseph Smith ordered William Clayton to burn or bury the minutes of the Council of Fifty. Joe's theocratic government system with its own constitution, the body which would replace Congress and the Senate following the Mormon American Revolution. Now, we did a three part series on the Council of 50, and we've read huge chunks from those minutes on the show since its inception in March of 1844. And most pages of the Council of 50, the R of K, the record of kingdom, most of the pages are relatively inconsequential. However, there are quite a few pages containing the most treasonous accounts of conversations shared among members of the council. Page after page contain details of where the next Mormon settlement would take place. Letter exchanges between leaders all over the nation seeking out a suitable location for a sovereign Mormon empire. A new constitution. Deliberations over petitions sent to Congress that declared Nauvoo a sovereign city-state tactics for federating the displaced natives and the freed slaves into a Mormon super army details of a conceived mission to Russia to form a shadow alliance with the czar. And most importantly, the first page of entries, which contained the very day and the proceeding of Joseph Smith being anointed prophet, priest, and King over all the world. There was enough material in the council of 50 minutes to Barry, Joseph, and every single member of the Council of Fifty with charges of treason and rebellion, while many of these men were officers in the Nauvoo Legion. Now, a court martial for all of the members of the Council of Fifty with the R of K, the Record of Kingdom, as Clayton wrote in his journal, that would immediately result in the death penalty for every one of those men. And I think it says a lot that Joe told Quilliam Claypen to burn or bury the minutes as he was in the act of abandoning his theocracy experiment in Nauvoo in order to head to Mexico where no laws could touch him. The Nauvoo theocracy experiment had failed, though not as spectacularly as the Far West experiment, right? But it was time to burn or bury everything and start anew in a place where outlaws are the rulers. Luckily for historians today, Quilliam Claypen resolved that the Council of 50 Minutes were too valuable to burn, and that anybody sent away from Nauvoo with the minutes tucked under their frock that was a significant liability. So Quilliam Claypen buried the Council of 50 Minutes immediately after the instructions were given. At one o'clock in the morning... And those minutes would remain in his garden for roughly two weeks before they were exhumed and they were nearly destroyed by the high water table in springtime uh, Nauvoo. Now, Quilliam Claypen would spend the following week reconstructing the minutes from what survived from being buried from his own journal and from his memory. 
And that Council of 50 Minute book was transported across the plains and it was retained in church archives, in the church vault, away from prying eyes and from the cries of historians screaming suppression of documents until, until 2016. Nobody was allowed access to this book until 2016. It's not like anybody who's in the Council of 50 was still in danger of treason because they all been dead for over 100 years. 2016, the church suppressed the Council of 50 document, this record book, for 170 years. And Clayton's personal journal from this time is still suppressed in the church vault to this day. (laughs) <laughs> all right i'm sorry for that little tangent but that's a super important entry in clay pen's journal about burning or burying the council of 50 minutes the r of k the record of kingdom and it reveals to me that even joe wasn't a hundred percent confident on his running for the hills plan because if he was captured and the record of the kingdom existed that would kill him that would immediately be the evidence the court needed to sentence him to death And everybody who was in the Council of Fifty, every one of them was acting out of the similar uh, accessory to treason. So with those final instructions from Joe to Quillian Claypen, it was time for Joe, Hiram, and Whiteout Willard Richards to embark on the skiff, rowed by Pistol Pack and Porter, and cross the Mississippi. Quote, About midnight, Joseph, Hiram, and Dr. Richards called for O.P. Rockwell, Pistol Pack and Porter, at his lodgings, and all went up the riverbank until they found Aaron Johnson's boat, which they got into and started about 2 a.m. to cross the Mississippi River. O.P. Rockwell rode the skiff, which was very leaky, so that it kept Joseph, Hiram, and the doctor busy bailing out the water with their boots and shoes to prevent it from sinking. End quote. They crossed the Mississippi, and they continued their journey up the river toward Montrose, Iowa, a Mormon settlement just up the river a couple of miles. Quote, Sunday, 23rd, at daybreak, arrived on the Iowa side of the river, sent O.P. Rockwell back to Nauvoo with instructions to return the next night with horses for Joseph and Hiram, pass them over the river in the night secretly, and be ready to start for the Great Basin in the Rocky Mountains. End quote. The plan was in place and all the pieces needed to simply fall into their respective places. And the Great Basin, (laughs) modern day Salt Lake City, would be the new home of the Mormon Empire headed by Joseph Smith, a fugitive from justice of three different states now. However, Joe, Hiram, and Whiteout Willard Richards they had been up for close to 24 hours straight. They needed a place to sleep, and arguably because of it's such a stressful time, they had been missing out on a lot of sleep at this time. So they needed a place to sleep, and they needed to make a base camp for their trip to Mexico, where, Hi- or where Pistolback and Porter could bring the horses for the trip. Kind of interesting, up for 24 hours and still going strong, with absolutely no breaks in the entries that follow. wonder what Dr. Richards kept in his medical bag. I really do wonder. Hey, you know... He was an herbal doctor, right? And if cocaine can make slaves work for 20 hours a day with only some Johnny cakes for sustenance, then cocaine was good enough for Joe and he'd be able to run his city and go to war with the state of Illinois, right? Quote, Joseph Hiram and Dr. Richards walked up to Captain John Killian's house where they arrived at sunrise, but he not being home, they went from thence to brother William Jordan's. About 9 a.m., Dr. Bernheisel came over the river to visit Joseph, end quote. They're cracking longer than 24 hours of being awake and dealing with this. Now, this this was a minor issue, right? Because messengers expected that Joe Hiram and Whiteout Willard Richards would be at John Killian's house. But instead, he was a couple miles away at William Jordan's house. Therefore, Pistol Pack and Porter was sent back to Nauvoo to let a few important people know where Joe was staying and to get the horses ready for the trek to the Rockies, which he would transport to Joe and Hiram under the cover of nightfall that following night. But during this morning trip to William Jordan's farm, 
something crucial happened in Nauvoo around 8 a.m. The arresting posse of 30 men on special order from Governor Ford entered the city, probably greeted with glares from every citizen of the city to arrest the prophet and his older brother. Governor Ford had told Joe in his last letter that if the constable didn't find the suspects in Nauvoo, the militia would be called out. The 30 men searched the city. They probably asked everybody they saw where Joe and Hiram were. And the criminals couldn't be found. Quote, Early in the morning, a posse arrived in Nauvoo to arrest Joseph, but as they did not find him, they started back to Carthage immediately, leaving one man of the name Yates behind them, who said to one of the brethren that Governor Ford designed that if Joseph and Hiram were not given up, he would send his troops and guard the city until they were found if it took three years to do it, End quote. Joe and Hiram's sidekick of Biff Smith defied the arrest orders. The consequences were known before they left town and they still left. The trip from Carthage to Nauvoo took most of a day and the posse of now 29 men wouldn't return to Carthage empty handed until that afternoon. At which point the solution was already laid out by governor Ford. He would have to call out a contingent of the state militia to enter Nauvoo and put it on lockdown until Joe and Hiram were found. Would the Nauvoo Legion allow this to happen, or would this refusal be the first act in the forthcoming Illinois Mormon War? Joe and Hiram's refusal to be arrested forced Governor Ford to show his hand, to step up and keep his word. The bets were on the table, and the Mormons called the hand. Now it was time to see who had the winning cards. The Illinois militia would be on the outskirts of Nauvoo before nightfall. The word honor carries a lot of weight to it, as does the accusation of cowardice. Now, personally, I struggle with the word honor. It's loaded. It can be interpreted in many ways. Oftentimes, Honor is coupled with movements which have been on the wrong side of history sometimes. Honor the motherland. The medal of honor because you happen to kill more people than your fellow soldiers. Honor thy father and thy mother even if they're wrong about everything in the world. But those expressions of honor are external. Honoring a movement or a group of people that you had no say in being part of oftentimes. Those expressions of honor require a commitment to an external movement or group. And that often requires an abandonment of individuality to uphold that honor. When it comes to Joseph Smith in this circumstance, honor carries a different context. It was honor internally focused. Honor for something that he had built for nearly a decade and a half, honoring his own legacy and his own movement, honoring the cult that he had constructed, which sought to be the final kingdom this world would ever need. Abandoning the Mormons in Nauvoo with total war on the horizon, when he was the only person who could prevent that war, that was an act of absolute cowardice and a dishonor. At no other point in their entire 14 years of existence did the Mormons need their leader more than June 23rd, 1844. At no other point in his entire public life did Joseph Smith display more cowardice and dishonor than this night of June 22nd to 23rd, 1844. Abandoning your squad in the heat of battle, that's one form of dishonor, but this was the general abandoning his entire army the morning before battle, an army, might I add, that he had personally recruited for over a decade. Many of the members, which are his own personal friends, right? This is Chinggis Khan running away from the Quarismian Shah after pursuing him for years. This is Hannibal bringing his troops across the Alps only to hop on an elephant and abandon his troops upon their entry into Rome. This is George Washington beginning the siege of Boston, running away, screaming, holding his pantaloons at the first cannon shot. This is Helaman 
marching his 2,000 stripling wars to the gates of Zarahemla, realizing how fortified the city is, and then jumping on his tapir and galloping off, leaving a trail of feces behind him. Besides, the, the most absurd part of this is that Joseph Smith had the protection of his almighty God on his side. How can he be a true prophet of God if he never gives his God a chance to rescue him from certain death? He was the anointed king of the world as God's chosen servant. God would never let the king of the world die to a ruthless mob of vigilantes unless, and bear with me on this one, he didn't actually believe a lot of the crap that he spewed from the pulpit. His last public speech, he asked if the Mormons were with him while he was clothed in general's military uniform and holding his sword to the sky. And of course, the people watching him say this answered in the affirmative. And he said, good, because I would have gone to the West and raised a more righteous people. What does that say about his true motivations? Now, when shove comes to punch, he runs away and he tells his closest friend to burn or bury their theocratic constitution. That's absolute dishonor. This series of events shows to me that Joseph Smith wasn't a leader. He was an opportunist with a penchant for being better than everybody else around him. He refused to own up to his own actions. He ran from the consequences of his decisions. He turned good people into villainous mobocrats and made people who were monsters his closest confidants. He had a duty. He had an obligation to the people that he had riled up for war for years now, many of whom he had dragged through a war already in Missouri. And when the time came to show his true colors, Joe was yellow. He was a damned coward who only talked a big game and clearly didn't truly believe that he possessed any magic powers over his enemies. So what do all of Joe's actions for the past four years in Nauvoo amount to? He's a peacock with feathers out while a dog is barking at it. He's a kid on the playground pounding their chest, yelling, come at me, bro, while surrounded by 12 of his friends. He's a man banging together pots and pans while a pack of hungry wolves circles him, never realizing that he shouldn't have been alone in the forest to begin with. It's posturing. It's ego masturbation. It's not for his 20,000 followers. It's all about him. That's what Mormonism was. It's about him. It always has been about him. And what's even more baffling is that he had the bigger gun in this standoff. The Nauvoo Legion outnumbered any force of the Illinois militia at least five to one. The Mormons had a larger city with more provisions. They had access to the Mississippi River to move those provisions and soldiers around quickly. They had the strategic and literal high ground along with a massive stone building which would serve as an amazing headquartered fort against cannon fire, and they even had their own cannons. The Mormons could pillage the local settlements for provisions, thereby winning any war of attrition against the Illinois forces. By every single calculus, the Mormons win this war, and if they somehow commit some massive blunder, the wide-open plains of the Iowa Territory opened into Native American reservations where the Mormons could retreat and find the welcoming arms of many Native Americans looking to take vengeance against the white settlers for stealing their land and committing genocide against them. Every single way you look at the Illinois Mormon War, the Mormons win, likely overwhelmingly. But then why didn't it go down this way? Well, Joseph Smith is the trolley problem that derails and kills everybody. He's the zombie cat in a box. He's the puzzle that will never be finished. He's the general who never fired a gun. He's the broken condom still in its wrapper. He's the revolutionary who never caused a revolution. He's a narcissistic coward fueled by an insatiable drive for self-aggrandizement with an uncanny sense of self-preservation. He's a walking paradox of posturing and fickleness. And if you try to predict his actions based on his public declarations, he'll prove you wrong every time. And most importantly, he was dangerous. From Thomas Ford.
Joe Smith, the most successful imposter in modern times, a man who, though ignorant and coarse, had some great natural parts which fitted him for temporary success, but which were so obscured and counteracted by the inherent corruption and vices of his nature that he never could succeed in establishing a system of policy which looked to permanent success in the future. His lusts, his love of money and power always set him to studying present gratification and convenience rather than the remote consequences of his plans. It seems that no power of intellect can save a corrupt man from this error. The strong cravings of the animal nature will never give fair play to a fine understanding. The judgment is never allowed to choose that good which is far away in preference to enticing evil near at hand. And this may be considered a wise ordinance of providence by which the counsels of talented but corrupt men are defeated in the very act which promises success. He always quailed before power and was arrogant to weakness. End quote. For all the years, his ignorance and arrogance extricated himself from situations just like this. The fact that in four days, four days, he'll be lying dead in a courtyard is a testament to how tenacious society can be when facing an absolute tyrant. And that's going to do it for the main segment today. We have a new patron to thank over at patreon.com slash naked Mormonism. Do y'all ever get sick of hearing me say that? Well, I got to say it every day. Got to pay the bills, right? So we have a new pledge from Eric. Thank you so much to Eric. And thank you so much to all of our patrons over at patreon.com slash naked Mormonism. Hey, what is patron? And what do you get when you sign up on patreon.com slash naked Mormonism? Whole bunch of extra content. Um, you, for at least the last 100 episodes, you get extended editions of every of at least the last 100 episodes. Plus, you have transcripts on the Patreon page of at least the last 100 episodes as well. For those of you who may enjoy reading instead of listening along to the podcast. I don't know who you are, um, but maybe there are some of you out there. So if you want transcripts and if you want extended editions of every of every new episode, as well as an extra episode every Monday Patreon.com slash Naked Mormonism. I also wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping when it comes to Patreon right now. Patreon just sent their creators a newsletter recently that they're going to need to begin charging sales tax on certain pledges. There's a lot of stuff associated with this. Uh, bottom line of it is Patreon is... Uh, may have to begin charging taxes for certain people who are pledging for certain levels that are getting certain benefits depending on certain locations of where the person who is pledging happens to live. I know it's kind of complicated, but I'm working on ways to try and w make a workaround for this so that it's able to save you patrons money so that you're not, you know, you don't have to pay those taxes. If you happen to fall into one of the Patreon tiers and into a location that you need to start paying sales tax. What does that mean? If you are someone who pays sales tax, um, it means that, you know, for the majority, the vast majority of my patrons, you're gonna have to pay like an extra 50 cents to a dollar uh, every month for your patron exclusive content. That sucks. That's money that I'm not seeing. That's money that's going out of your account and that's just going to taxes. And I don't know how Patreon has gone this long without having to charge sales tax for certain pledges. I don't envy them having to orchestrate the mess of algorithms that uh, determines who does and doesn't pay taxes and for what tiers and for what content. But essentially... The way that it works for a lot of localities is if you're getting extra digital content for supporting a, a content creator, then you may be charged sales tax for it. But if you like get a shout out on the podcast, that's not 
taxable, but if you're like getting extended editions of episodes, then that is taxable, but only if you live in certain locations in certain states and in certain countries. It's a big mess. I'm sorry. So right now I'm kind of working through a way to try and circumvent this so that I can pass those savings on to the patrons because I recognize that supporting this show or supporting any content creator, it's a purely luxury, you know, kind of donation based thing. It's a content creator that you like. Maybe they give you extra content or maybe it's just they're working towards a cause that you support. And I understand that those are luxury charges. It's it's, it's not something that is required. It's not something that you need to eat. Right. So I'm trying to figure out maybe I can create a separate Patreon only podcast feed basically um that's uh, that's available in regular podcasts instead of through the Patreon website but then I would you know have to give the link to that specific RSS feed to the people who sign up to support Patreon but then that would allow people to just like support for one episode at $1 and then they could cancel their subscription and they'd still have access to all the extra Patreon content, which sucks. I don't really have any quality control in that uh, the way that Patreon.com does have. So I, I, needless to say, I'm working through it. I'm trying to figure out ways to save you the most money to make sure that the least amount is taken out of your money and that the, the majority of the money that you are giving to this show actually goes to me as the content creator of the show. There's a lot to work through. If you're a supporter on Patreon, you're probably going to be getting an email at the beginning of next month, this June 2020, where they kind of detail whether or not you fall into one of those taxable brackets or whether or not content that you're purchasing is actually taxable. And you're going to begin paying sales tax as a separate line item in your Patreon uh, receipt every month. It's kind of a big mess. I'm sorry. It's just one of those necessary changes that has to happen. I, and that's, that's the, that's the end of it. So I guess I'll just wrap that up by saying to all of our patron supporters who do support the show, I really do appreciate the money that you give me to help fund this research and to bring you content every week and to tell you a serialized and accessible format of Mormon history. And that's, that's it. <laughs> that's the long and short of it. That's what really matters. I really appreciate you guys. And if you aren't a supporter on patreon.com, slash naked mormonism consider doing it if you can't consider leaving us a review or sharing us on facebook twitter or your favorite social media app or leaving us a review on whatever podcatching app that you use uh but if you didn't you gave me your most valuable resource you hung in there to the end of the episode and i really appreciate that more than anything so for giving me your time for sticking into the end of the episode and for everything that all of you amazing listeners do for me Thank you so much for lending me your ear. Hope to talk to you next time here on the Naked Mormonism Podcast. This podcast is produced with the help of Julie Briscoe as social media manager and Brian Ziegenhagen as audio engineer. Music is written and produced by Jason Camo of a lost state of mind dot bandcamp dot com and used with permission. Legal counsel is provided by Andrew Torres of the law offices of P. Andrew Torres in the opening arguments podcast. Naked Mormonism is a production of Ground Gnomes LLC. Copyright 2020. All rights reserved. Hey there, patrons. How's everybody doing tonight? Today, this morning, I don't know when you're going to listen to this. I don't know what time of day it is or time of night it is. I get emails occasionally of like, I love to, you know, let your podcast play while I go to sleep. I'm like, oh, all right, yeah, Mormon history puts a lot of people to sleep. I get you. <laughs>
Um, so for a variety segment today, uh, I want to talk about something that's, you know, tangentially Mormonism, but also something that maybe some of you can resonate with. And, uh, that is talking to loved ones who are believing in the church, who do believe in the church, who go to church. Um, cause I just this, this week I had a conversation with my parents and, um, you know, and, and maybe this is something that resonates with you. Maybe it's not, you know, turn it off, you know, you don't have to listen to this, but this is the variety segment. This is when I just kind of unload, take off, uh, the chains of the script and just get a kind of talk. And, uh, that's what I'm doing today. So that's what I'm doing right now. Anyway, so talking to my parents and maybe for you, it's talking to your kids, talking to your uncle, talking to, uh, your coworker talking to whatever. Um, but I, I'm talking to my parents this week and I found that more and more, whenever I do talk to my parents, very rarely is it a, uh, five minute, Hey, how you doing? Hey, uh, I needed to ask you about something. Hey, did you get that email I sent you? Whatever the case is, right? More and more, our conversations are turning into long, long conversations. And you know, that, that, that is good and bad. That is good and bad. Uh, you know, for times whenever I see them call, I look at my schedule and I look at how much work that I need to get done today or what I'm doing. And I'm like, man, do I have two hours? Do I have anything that I need to get done in the next two hours? And if not, I'll answer. Um, and you know, it's more and more frequently those conversations are breaking into that two hour mark. But, um, of course we're talking about, current events, right? And and it's so hard to talk about issues now with people who are on the opposite side of the political divide from you without the conversation escalating, without the conversation turning into an argument or a fight. I find it very, very hard to restrain the things that I want to say in conversation with my parents because they do fall on the the far right end of the spectrum, right? Like my parents tell me in most of our conversations that they were tired of all the spin. So they watch Fox news. They were sick of how politicized and how, uh, you know, motivated and agenda driven everything is. So they decided that it's just to get the bare bone facts. They're going to watch Fox news. And, and I, I cringe. I cringe when I hear them say that. And they both said it to me. <laughs> multiple times now. And, and it's, it's so hard to not just reach through the phone and shake them. And you're like, do you know what you're saying? Do you have any idea what you're actually saying right now? Um, but that's, that's not productive to a conversation. And I'm determined that every conversation that I have with my parents is a conversation and not a debate because that's not what I'm going for. I I'm trying to utilize critical thinking skills to seek first to understand then to be understood. Because if I can, uh, if, if I come into a conversation with my parents hot, they're not going to hear, they're not going to listen to anything that I'm saying. People hearing without listening, right? They're, they'll hear the words that come out of my mouth, but it's not going to penetrate the barrier that they have built up around them that forms the, the callous uh, barrier that their echo chamber resonates inside of. And nothing's going to get through that barrier, right? So this latest conversation with my parents, we were talking, of course, the Rona, right? The big bad COVID-19 coronavirus. And it's something that's on everybody's mind because everybody's affected by it right now. But my parents live in Utah. And uh, I live up here in bright blue dot Seattle. That's in an otherwise fairly red state. Uh, but w there's enough people in Seattle that the population of the state generally keeps the state pretty blue. Uh, but it's a very purple state because if not for this blue dot, it'd be a very red state. Regardless, I live in Seattle, very liberal, progressive area. My parents live in Utah, a very, very red conservative area. And both of us are largely products of the people with whom we associate, the media we choose to consume, and the area in which we live. And I get that, that all those factors play into our biases and the way that we understand information. Uh, so when my sister, who also lives in Utah, asked if she could come up and visit me here in Seattle in July with her son, I flat out told her, no, don't come up here. Do not 
come up here right now. Do not come up in July. Do not come up in any of the year of 2020 because dad is immunocompromised. And if you come up here, your chances of catching it are highly likely. And both you and your son are, you know, perfect to be asymptomatic carriers. If you catch it or if your son catches it, dad is dead. You realize that, right? He's immunocompromised. He has to take medications for pre-existing conditions. He is dead if he catches it. And just because you want to come up and see Seattle and flights are really cheap right now, that's not the risk worth taking if it means that we're going to kill dad. It's not worth it, okay? And I told her flat out, you're not coming up here. She seemed uh, perturbed by that and said, well, it must be different here, uh, different there than it is here. You know, the reflection of Seattle versus Utah versus, you know, Southern Utah, very, very conservative Utah. Um, and my reply was just the numbers, right? Nearly 100,000 dead, 30 million unemployed. How do you not understand the gravity of this situation? How do you not grasp that this is a massive issue and that travel only accentuates those issues, only makes those scary numbers bigger. So in talking to my parents this week, we chatted for a long time about Corona and about the way that our states are dealing with this. And my parents said that they think it's totally blown out of proportion, that it's completely unreasonable what the states are doing and what governors are doing and that they're opposing the president. The president knows best and that these various governors are flaunting the law, keeping state-at-home orders in place when the citizens don't want it and so on and so forth. And my dad said that uh, he refuses to shop at Costco because Costco requires people who shop there to wear a mask and he doesn't want to wear a mask. He he just doesn't want to wear one, so he refuses to go to Costco. He says, they can't have my money. They're going to make me wear a mask. And I said, why? <laughs> you're immunocompromised. You're the, the most likely. I mean, you're knocking on the door of your 60s. You are the most likely population to die from this, right? And then he said, well, I mean, it's so blown out of proportion The you know, I saw uh, some numbers that the fatality rate is only 0.0181% of people are actually dying from this. And I, I, all I can think of is he's just parroting what he saw on Fox News last night. That's just a blatant lie. And he's incapable of understanding that he is a he is a propagator he is a signal amplifier for lies and for propaganda that is deliberately manufactured during a contentious presidential election year he's incapable of grasping that concept that his thoughts are being controlled and grasping the concept that the people on the tv box are lying to him he, he he doesn't seem to grasp that, but at the same time, it thinks that anybody who's talking on the TV box that has the little CNN symbol at the bottom of the screen, they're, no matter what they say, it's all lies. But if it's got a little Fox symbol on it, then no matter what they say is truth, right? The, it's a very frustrating <laughs> concept. And I'm sure that a lot of you can probably understand and resonate with this. And maybe you are having some of these same conversations with loved ones. Uh, but come to find out, you know, my, my parents are just doing their thing as if th- there is nothing going on. And that as if this is just a Democrat conspiracy to make Trump look bad. That's how my parents see this. And maybe that's how your kids see this. Maybe that's how your coworker sees this. Maybe that's how, you know, not your Mormon, but you're, uh, you're just conservative regardless of religious beliefs, but your conservative neighbor sees what's going on. And it's so troubling to me. And so we got in this, this long conversation and there was a, a one point that I, I, I could feel the conversation getting heated and I just said, so we need to not talk about this anymore because there's a serious problem right now by virtue of the fact that we can't even agree 
on trustworthy sources of information, not even commentary, not even reporting on information, but the sources of information themselves that get reported on by all the pundits and talking heads. We can't even agree on whether or not the source of that information is reasonable, whether or not we can even trust the CDC numbers. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a little frustrating when my parents are watching a TV show that is telling them that there are doctors who are uh, being forced to uh, inflate their numbers when at the same time I'm reading press releases about doctors who are, uh, you know, being, uh, let's say, let go or doctors who are resigning because they are being directed to minimize the actual numbers. We have these two competing narratives, but we still share one reality. And I struggle every time when I talk to, to my parents, and maybe it's your parents for you. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's your coworker. I struggle every time because there's this communication divide that cannot be breached. We, we cannot bridge the gap. We, we can't break through the barrier and have a real conversation and agree about anything to even begin to understand each other. But I do also want to say that, like, there is value in seeking having those conversations, I believe. I, re I really do truly believe that because by the end, you know, of the, our conversation, I was asking my parents, like, can I send you some masks? I'll, I'll be happy to make you some masks and send you some. Uh, and my mom was like, no, we, we have masks. We're fine. Don't worry about it. So even if I wasn't able to convey enough information for them to see this epidemic through my eyes... I was able to instill in them the thought and the feeling that I genuinely am concerned for their well-being because I am. If it, if one of my parents catches it, my dad is dead. <laughs> he, he just is. He just is. And I, I don't know how to deal with that information uh, because it's some, it's a threat that they don't take seriously, but a threat that is very, very real for both of them. Um, getting into their sixties right now. And that gap, um, it, it's so weird to me that, that there's this dichotomous way of viewing everything instead of just viewing the thing itself. There has to be the perspective that I agree with and the perspective I disagree with instead of just the thing itself. Right. That's why I spend very little time on Facebook and Twitter and spend time on Reddit because Reddit is talking about things instead of people's, perspectives of things, right? It's a, it's a pretty broad brush. So forgive me if that doesn't, you know, agree with your interpretation of the things, but that's my interpretation. And that's, that's kind of where I find the most, um, mind expansion for myself. So if we, we, we're unable to agree on the thing itself, much less the interpretation of the thing, then kind of everything is lost, isn't it? Nothing really matters. But I do think that there is value in having those conversations to break down the barriers of the perspectives that we talk about the things, about people's perspectives of the thing, to get an emotion across about the thing that is truly genuine. And when I talked to my parents this week and I was able to convey that genuine concern and, 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 and at, at its root, that fear for their well-being to them. I feel like that actually made more headway than arguing about what, <laughs> you know, what pundits are saying about something, you know, what Stephen Novella says versus what Dr. Oz says, right? It's tough. It, it, it's really, it's complicated, but I do feel like there is, there's a way to broach these conversations that requires a lot of deliberate word choice, a lot of time, a lot of work, a lot of mental effort to get through those. And I have found success in having those conversations by laying my perspectives of issues aside and trying to understand where my parents are coming from, whether it's your uncle or whether it's your cousin or whether it's your neighbor, um, understanding where they are coming from and then trying to convey my thoughts or my fears or my emotions or my happiness about something. 
And that's just as much the case with politics as it is with religion. And my parents and I are able to have some amicable conversations about Mormonism. I was able to get my mom to laugh when I said, I'm willing to bet that some of the apostles are dumber than sour owl shit about a lot of things. And she laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. I mean, these are people that she holds as basically flawless, right? They're, they're the perfect men who run the perfect church, uh, even if the men do happen to be imperfect sometimes. Uh, but she did laugh at it, which which made me so happy that I was having that deep human connection to make my mom laugh about something that I said derisive about a church leader that has never happened before. In any of the many conversations that we've had, Um, there is progress to be made. And, and I guess that's kind of my overall message about this, this patron um, blathering that I'm doing here. This, this extended, you know, the variety show is even if it feels like all hope is lost and you can never communicate with somebody who you happen to be on the opposite sides of a spectrum of whatever that spectrum is religion, politics, whatever, those are, you know, the hot button topics. So that's what I throw out as the examples. There is progress to be made. There is a conversation that can be had there. Even if that does require you putting in a ton of effort to holding your tongue, to listening to what they say, to listening to what their true fears are and what they're, what they're, the, attacking the root of what they are saying instead of just what they are saying, the cause of the information that they are saying to you. Grasping what that concept is, is far more important than whatever the political issue and the political sides or the religious sides happen to be. And I think a lot of people feel like that's a lost cause. I can never talk with my racist uncle because he just, he's so backwards and he's, he's just, he's wrong about everything. I can never have those conversations. Um, yeah, maybe you you can't in your situation. Uh, but I sincerely believe that if the conversations are conducted in the right way and you stay as far away from buzzwords and from, you know, stuff that's just generated in order to fire up the other side, stay as far away from that and stick to the thing itself and to having a genuine conversation and to listening what the other person says that headway can be made. And I, I, I've long believed this about many issues in society that we may see problems that are going on around us and we may all recognize that there are indeed problems. We just disagree about the solution to that problem. And, and for many people, it's like, uh, you know, deregulation for other people, it's more regulation. Uh, for some people it's, um, whatever, I'm not, I'm not even going to weigh in on any of it, but if we can stick to what that issue is and talk about the issue and then reason with how to possibly get to whatever a solution is, instead of just pointing out that there is a problem. And then this is what one side of the political or religious spectrum says, this is what the other side says. If we can focus on having a unique conversation instead of devolving into platitudes and buzzwords, the unique conversation is where headway can be made and where relationships can be forged. So, um, on a personal level, like I've, I've had a a relatively good relationship with my parents. It's, it's obviously fluctuated quite a lot. Uh, but (laughs) there's always an elephant in the room, right? I make my living off of attacking their religion, right? Like that's how they see it anyway. Um, that's not how I would package my job, but that is how they see my job. And the more that I can communicate the nuance of what is really there and, you know, the people who they may revere, who I revere as well, right? Like the book Carthage Conspiracy, you know, it was co-written by Dallin Oaks. One of the, the you know, he's the first counselor in the, the first presidency right now. It's a, it's a good history book. Like it's Dallin Oaks ventured into the field of Mormon history and wrote a genuinely good history book and hasn't written any good book since then. But it does prove to me that Dallin Oaks may have some backwards thoughts and beliefs, but he is an intellectual at his core. 
And I can and I can compliment Dallin Oaks and use that as the first rope across the chasm to on which to construct a bridge to have a conversation about how the people who run the church are not pure perfect dudes. They are fallible people and that they are products of the same culture that made my parents the same culture that made me who I am and that we can have intellectuals within the leadership of the church. Um, and that may not be your cup of tea. That may not be what you want to do. Maybe you want to just rant on Twitter. Uh, maybe you want to get in a, uh, you know, a 300 comment long debate about something that nobody is ever going to read ever. And you're never going to convince that other person. Maybe that is what, you know, what motivates you. Maybe you enjoy that, right? And that's fine. I'm just making the argument that there is a place for all approaches. And my choice of approach, sorry, my approach of choice is to seek first to understand and then to be understood. Because I think that that is the bridge building that we need to try and break out of this hyper normalized and it, excessively partisan world that we live in and this this bipolar world everything is good or bad everything is one side or the other side and trying to work to 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 divide uh or to to get or build a bridge across that divide it's not as easy as it sounds i'm making it sound like oh the, i'm just spewing platitudes um and i only have my own personal experiences in communicating across this divide to to offer as proof that it can be done and if there's any more proof needed the vast majority of my colleagues in mormon history are staunch believers in mormonism but they still consider me their colleagues right i mean i was on at jwha i was on the stump the professors panel with two people who actively currently work for the church in the history department and a BYU professor and the chairperson of Mormon history association, right? Like those are people who very much believe the church is true. I very much disbelieve the church is true. Um, but we were able to have amicable conversations and share in each other's presentations and ask fun and engaging questions of each other's presentations and, and have fun and laugh because it's not that we are enemies across this this divide. It's that we think that we are enemies. And that's really the thought that needs to be defeated for us to realize that no solutions come about when we view each other as enemies. So there's all of my platitudes. I am out. I am extinguished on platitudes for today and none of it probably makes any sense to you, but Hey, you know what? Everything that I said today in this, this patron exclusive section, it, it feels true. I believe that it's true. And you can't say anything about my beliefs without me getting mad. <laughs> uh, what the hell 2020? What have you done to us? All right. Thanks everybody for listening. Thank you patrons uh, for, for supporting the show. It really means a lot to me. And uh, I'll see you next Monday for the next installment, the final installment of Manuscript Story, Conneaut Creek. Take care, everybody.